I'm happy to announce that we are going on Periscope Depth again with Scott Ritter. Scott, thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, the very first question I want to ask you, how are you, actually? I'm doing fine, thanks. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm fine. Some pretty interesting events just... um, I've been uh, recently, so uh, you know what I'm talking about. So um, I'm, I feel great <laughs> about all this, actually. So, um, okay, Scott, uh, let's start uh, from the hottest point, I guess, uh, this situation about Kharkov. So how you see it? Um, how uh, you see the situation about Kharkov? Do you expect uh, this city, the assault on the city, or maybe you consider that uh, the city would be rather encircled and uh, uh, there won't be any fighting, street fighting, or something like that, uh, what happened in Mariupol, and uh, all the things which are uh, on the map right now? What's your take on those? I think if we're talking about um, a battle of Kharkov, you're talking about the wrong thing. Um, First of all, the Russian military, the Russian government has never made uh, the capture of Kharkov a a strategic uh, point of interest. They have never talked about the capture of Kharkov, even today. There's no talk about it. Uh, The most that's been spoken of is the need to create a buffer zone. Uh, to push Ukrainian forces back from the border with uh, Russia so that uh, Ukrainian artillery won't be able to shell uh, Belgorod. That's the stated objective. If you want to look at it from a broader perspective, you know, Russia has not been in the business since the earliest stages of this war of drawing big red arrows on a map in surrounding cities and capturing cities. Uh, That, of course, was something that was done in phase one which was sort of a shock and awe uh, phase of this conflict designed to get Ukraine to go to the negotiating table. But with the collapse of the Istanbul communique at the um, end of March, early April, you know, Russia transitioned into um, attritional warfare, uh, where the goal and objective um, was to destroy the Ukrainian military. Straight up, that's what demilitarization is. There's been two objectives, demilitarization, denazification. None of those have an implied um, mission requirement of capturing major uh, population centers. So when people speak of the capture of Kharkov, the capture of Odessa, the capture of this, the capture of that, um, you'll never find the Russian government making that statement. You'll never find the Russian military making that statement. This is speculation on the part of outside observers. The goal of the Russian military has, since the initiation of phase two, been very straightforward. The securing of the Donbass, and then later, when Russia uh, annexed Kherson and Zaporizhia, the securing of those two territories as well, because they are now part of Russia, and Russia will secure Russia. There are no other Russian territories out there. No matter what you, me, anybody else might say about Kharkov, today it's a Ukrainian city. And the Russian government recognizes as such. Odessa is a Ukrainian city. And the Russian government recognizes it as such. So when we speak of military objectives, and uh, I think we need to stop drawing lines and arrows towards Kharkov and reflect on what this war is about. At this stage, this war is about the destruction of the Ukrainian military. Now, what Russia has done in pursuing the creation of this buffer zone to secure Russia, again, look at the thematics here, um, is to open up a second front, so to speak. That what, what is the purpose of attritional warfare? It's to grind the enemy down to nothing. Uh, the goal is to reduce enemy combat capabilities so that they can no longer have effective resistance that leads to the collapse of Um, the enemy's ability to continue this war. Now, Russia has done this by uh, 
through meat grinder operations uh, it, that the Ukrainians have only willingly participated in. They've been sending their troops on suicidal assaults against prepared Russian defenses for some time now. And even when Russia attacks, it doesn't attack with big arrows. It attacks in small chunks where it uses its superiority and firepower to inflict massive casualties on the Ukrainians before uh, occupying a village, a tree line, uh, a canal. Uh, there's there's no big arrow drive on Berlin type thing going on here. It's merely an operation designed to grind the Ukrainian military down to nothing. Now, when you get the Ukrainians weakened along, for instance, the eastern line of contact from Kherson up into um, Lugansk and even into the northern part of uh, Kharkov, um, you stretch the enemy's defenses very thin. What was the purpose of opening up a second front? to divert Ukrainian strategic reserves to that second front, to compel Ukraine to take resources away from the eastern line of contact and put them in this new front to further weaken the eastern line of contact. That's the equivalent of a meat grinder operation. You have weakened the enemy. And what does this do? It creates additional opportunities for Russian forces to continue their slow, methodical meat grinding advance killing more Ukrainians than the Ukrainians can replace. They've opened up a second front now. All of Ukraine's strategic reserves are flowing into Kharkov. As we speak, these reserves are being destroyed by Russian firepower, air power, artillery power, multiple launch rocket systems, ballistic missiles. Um, and when they reach the front line, they're destroyed by Russian troops. Now, has Russia eliminated its ability to continue to um, create new fronts? No. As we speak, there's uh, you know, reports of tens of thousands of Russian troops uh, massing outside of uh, in the Sumi direction. Um, what happens if Russia opens up a front there as well? Where does Ukraine get the resources to man that front? Who will they have to rob to send forces up there? What will they accomplish? They will further weaken Ukrainian forces. Is that it? When Russia sends troops up into Sumi, is that the end of the Russian offensive? No. Russia has more troops. And they'll send more troops in. Maybe they'll exploit a weakening of the Ukrainian forces in the Zaporizhia direction. Maybe they'll exploit a weakening of the forces in the Donetsk direction or Lugansk direction. And they'll exploit that. Not what will Ukraine do? Divert resources. What happens when it runs out of resources? When there's nothing left? When Russia is broken through and there's no troops left to plug the gap? It's over for Ukraine. That's what's going on here. And when it's over for Ukraine, Russia gets to dictate the terms of conflict termination. And what those terms will be, we shall see. Maybe the political objective will be that Kharkov becomes a Russian city, that Odessa becomes a Russian city. But these are not military objectives as stated by the Russian government right now. The military objective has been, is, and will continue to be the demilitarization of Ukraine. And that takes place when Russian soldiers kill Ukrainian soldiers or stretch them so thin that they can no longer resist effectively. That's what's happening in Kharkov. Yes, but uh, you know, uh, I ran into another question here. So, mm, well, uh, so sort of legal question. Okay, uh, Ukraine is at the negotiation table with Russia. Not negotiating, but uh, signing up unconditional terms. With whom? Now, I don't think there is a recognized uh, from our side the uh, state leader. The Zelensky's uh, presidential uh, term is over. Well, what about a week ago or so? And uh, who's going to sign? these documents from the Ukrainian side. And uh, it's really hard to imagine that uh, Zelensky will be willing to do so himself because that would make him effective immediately, well, <laughs> a prisoner. And uh, he would get to a court of law just for, well, what is considered to be his, what he's done. So, um... What do you think about that? And uh, what would uh, would Western patrons of uh, Ukraine, today's Ukraine, let Ukraine do that? 
maybe Russia will be forced to go forward, forward and forward with uh, the political objection and the military objection of demilitarization. Well, I think Zelensky's boxed himself into a, into a corner. He's made himself irrelevant from uh, the Russian perspective. He refuses to negotiate in good faith. He puts forward unrealistic uh, expectations. He's holding a fake uh, peace conference in uh, Switzerland um, without Russia's participation. How can you even begin to talk about this without Russian participation? Um, and so what the Russians are doing are, is is creating a um, political environment that makes Zelensky dispensable, disposable, desirable to be removed. Um, look, I, I have a personal issue with um, anybody, Russian, American, European, um, interpreting the Ukrainian constitution for the Ukrainian people. That's just me personally. I, I think, you know, only Ukraine gets to determine who their president is. It's Nobody else has a, has a say. But that doesn't mean that Russia can't get engaged in political warfare, which is what Russia is doing right now. Russia is raising questions. I think uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin said the same thing I said. He said it's the Constitution of Ukraine makes it clear. Uh, you can't have presidential elections during a martial law. But he said uh, that doesn't mean that Zelensky is automatically extended as president. Um and you know, so he's throwing you know uncertainty into the mix. Uh, the, I think the goal of Russia in this um, in, in this instance is to delegitimize Zelensky in the eyes of not only the Ukrainian people but um, the, their Western sponsors, their Western allies, uh, so that Zelensky is removed from power. Um, you know what the political end game uh, in Ukraine will be? Who knows? I think at the end of the day. Um, a surrender is going to happen regardless of who's there. Um, you know, and, and if it comes down to it, uh, you know, did Russia, did the Soviet Union need Adolf Hitler's signature on the surrender documents in Berlin? No, he was dead. They needed General Krebs. And if General Krebs wasn't there, they'd have taken General X, General Y, or General Z. It didn't matter. They were going to take somebody, sit them down, sign the document, and the war was going to end. When it comes time, when the military objective of demilitarization has been achieved, when Ukraine can no longer resist, when there is collapse uh, on the front lines, somebody in Ukraine will sit down and sign a document. It doesn't matter who. And there's, it, it's really a waste of time for any of us to sit here and speculate about what name will be. Did General Krebs turn around and govern post-war Germany? No. A new political process took place. Who will govern post-war Ukraine? Probably not anybody affiliated with the Ukrainian government today or the Ukrainian military today. Um, more than likely, it might be somebody um, affiliated with the Ukrainian government that existed prior to the events of Maidan, whether that is a former prime minister, a former president, or a former member of parliament, we don't know. Um, but it won't be anybody affiliated with Zelensky. The West doesn't get a vote. The West is irrelevant. They can have as many Switzerland conferences as they want. It just doesn't matter. Russia's not in the business of allowing the West or Zelensky to dictate the terms of conflict resolution. Russia has very clear objectives. Vladimir Putin and the Russian government have not uh, shied from these objectives uh, at all. Demilitarization, denazification. Um, we're reaching the end game of this conflict. We're reaching the point where It'll become militarily impossible for Ukraine to continue to resist. The West has lost the ability to uh, sustain support for Ukraine economically, militarily, and politically. And um, the Zelensky government, I think, is um, about to enter the pages of history as the former government of Ukraine. So we shall see. It's, uh, it's an interesting time. Um, but uh, the, the one thing that is certain is that the Russians have a plan. And that plan uh, revolves around demilitarization and denazification and trying to be specific about, you know, who crosses the T's and dots the I's on, on a surrender document, I think is uh, it's a waste of time because it doesn't matter. 
Scott, uh, this brings us uh, to another question. Yes, this is scenario number one. If another scenario doesn't get involved, so what uh, I'm speaking about? Uh, some Western leaders, along with uh, NATO leader Jens Stoltenberg, just uh, insist on blessing Ukrainian army to officially use Western weapons, American weapons, German weapons, any long-range weapons, to use them to strike deep inside Russian territory. So, uh, saying people like Viktor Orban sound quite an alarm not to do that, uh, warning about the World, World War Three and nuclear war scenarios. And uh, it's lo it looks like Stoltenberg and uh, the others just either don't hear or just uh, don't believe that Russia warning about uh, such actions uh, was more than serious. And FSB just announced that NATO uh, started the huge nuclear strikes exercises just next to Russian border. So what's your take on that? What's going on? And are we at real risk of uh, such blessing? And Russia's serious answer uh, as following. When Russia initiated its military operation in Ukraine, it, um, it specifically called it and referred to it as a special military operation. That implies something different than war, total war. I, let me just take a step back. Uh, Russia is a mature nation, a very responsible nation, a realistic nation. Um, I don't believe Russia is in a situation where if... Ukraine were to use long-range NATO weapons against Russian targets that Russia collapses, folds, quits, surrenders, etc. Russia knows what war is, and Russia will deal with these situations as they arise. Uh, so, you know, I don't fear the, um, the defeat of Russia. If Ukraine were to use weapons of this nature, remember this, I just want to remind everybody watching this, Russia has been blowing the living hell out of Ukraine using similar weapons now for two and a half years. Has Ukraine surrendered? Has Ukraine been defeated? Russia's destroyed the Ukrainian, um, you know, um, energy um, complex. Is the war over? Russia's blown up Ukraine's industrial uh, infrastructure. Is the war over? Russia's blown up rail lines, bridges, uh, oil depots. Is the war over? No, it's not. So people who are sitting there getting nervous about Ukraine now attacking Russia, it complicates the war. But you're at war. And at some point in time, when you go to war against somebody and uh, they are backed into a corner, they will do that which is necessary from their perspective to survive. And you will pay a price. If Russia doesn't want to be attacked by Ukraine using Western provided weapons, they shouldn't have started this conflict to begin with. Because this was an inevitable outcome. This was always going to happen. I happen to believe that Russia is a nation that tragically, but necessarily can absorb these attacks and still prevail. Um, and again, I just remind people, look at the damage that's been done to Ukraine, and they're still there, fighting, resisting. This isn't going to be the end of Russia, and I think it's a waste of time for Russians to speculate about this from a military perspective. Politically, it's different, because Russia has said this is a special military operation, and Russia has excluded certain targets from strike, because they said we are not at war. Um, Russia's always made this about liberation of uh, the Donbass of now the new, new Russian territories, they've never made it about the destruction of Ukraine. If Ukraine decides to strike Russia, then the goals and objectives of Russia might um, necessarily change. And Russia will strike a different set of targets because Russia isn't going to absorb a Ukrainian attack without um, there being severe consequences for Ukraine. 
The question now is, will Russia allow this to, you know, again, I just remind your audience, Russia is on the verge of winning this conflict. And Russia wins this conflict by preventing this conflict from expanding into a broader conflict with NATO. If you think that a war with NATO, and I know there's a lot of people out there who, um, you know, NATO's a paper tiger, NATO's this, NATO's that, NATO can't do this. Look, I'm not here to extol the virtues of NATO. NATO has a lot of problems. But if you don't think NATO can bring harm to Russia, then you don't know what you're talking about. NATO has a serious quantity of long-range precision strike weapons that can strike deep into the side of Russia and hurt Russia badly. That doesn't mean Russia is defeated. But, you know, Russia has, for the most part, not suffered the consequences of total war. Yes, Belgorod has been shelled. Yes, the cities in the Donbass have been shelled. Yes, some oil facilities around Russia have been struck by drones. That's not total war. Total war is when death and destruction rains down on the cities and factories inside Russia. That hasn't happened. If you go to war against NATO, it will happen. Guaranteed. That doesn't mean that Russia doesn't hurt NATO. Of course Russia will hurt NATO. Russia will respond in kind. But it's a new kind of conflict that will not end quickly and may not end in anybody's advantage. Because at that point, it becomes an existential conflict for both Russia and NATO. Winner take all. That means the loser will use what? Nuclear weapons. And we all die. So for everybody out there who's saying, well, if Ukraine does X, Y, and Z, Russia will do this in return. I don't necessarily know if that's true. Because Russia's job is to win this conflict, bring an end to this conflict without expanding the conflict. If the decision is made to expand the conflict, that's a NATO decision, not a Russian decision. Russia's shown a great deal of patience, understanding. People criticize the Russian government, say, oh, it's weak. So many red lines have been crossed. Weak. Every Russian that wakes up this morning in a city that is blessed with peace and prosperity. How weak is the Russian government? What do you want? Total war? Do you want to wake up with the apartment building next to you blown up with your mother, father, sister, brother dead? Your job no longer existing because a missile blew up your factory? You don't want that. So stop talking as if you do. Stop talking as if the consequences here won't be severe for Russia. Because death will rain down on your cities. It doesn't mean you're defeated, but it means your life changes dramatically. You don't want that. Your government has been very, very responsible in managing the provocations of the West. Very responsible. Just think back in time. Where were you in the fall of 2022 when Igor Strelkin and everybody else is saying that Putin should be shot, Shoigu should be shot, everybody should be shot because they, they betrayed the Russian people, allowed the Ukrainians to come in and take Karnikov and Kherson. Oh, my God, the right bank of Kherson has fallen to the Ukrainians. It's all over. It's all over. It's not over. It just began. It just began. Oh, my God, the counteroffensive. They're going to come in. They're going to, oh, they're going to split off uh, Crimea and it's all going to be over. Oh, they're going to blow up the Kerch Bridge. Oh, they're going to do this. Oh, they're going to. It doesn't matter because the Russian government has been calm throughout. Calm throughout. When did you see Putin panic? You've seen Stoltenberg panic. You've seen every Western leader panic. When did you see Putin panic? Never. When did you see Shoigu panic? When did you see Gerasimov panic? Never. Why? Because they know what the objective is. They know where they're going. They love Russia more than those Russians who are demanding a Russian retaliation love Russia. Because Putin and the Russian leadership loves Russia so much that they're willing to suffer minor embarrassments of so-called red lines being crossed than sacrifice their country just to score some cheap political points. Because once you go to war with NATO, 
everything fundamentally changes. Everything fundamentally changes. This is a point I try to make over and over again. I caution NATO not to fight Russia because I believe that NATO doesn't have the military capability to defeat Russia using conventional weapons, that the NATO armies are not capable of doing that. But never once have I implied that NATO lacks the ability to bring death and destruction on Russia. NATO does. And I'm talking about conventional weapons. I'm not talking about nuclear weapons. I'm talking about long range strike. You can make fun of Germany all you want. If Germany unleashes 1,000 long range precision strike Taurus missiles against Russia, that will hurt Russia severely. There will be harm brought to Russia, economic harm. Is this what Russia wants? The answer is no, of course not. So Russia is winning the war in Ukraine. This war has become more than just a battle on Ukrainian soil, but a battle of geopolitical um, you know, consequence where the collective West is trying to strategically defeat Russia, and Russia is trying to prevent that strategic feat, defeat from happening without expanding it into a broader conflict. I have confidence in the Russian government that they will not fall victim to the provocations of the West. I don't have confidence in the Western government that they will avoid provoking Russia. But let's put this in perspective. Jan Stoltenberg, how much power does Jan Stoltenberg have on a scale of zero to 10? The answer is negative 25. No, he has no power, none. Jan Stoltenberg can order nothing to happen, nothing. He can pick up the phone and get nothing done. His words have no meaning. That's why the deputy prime minister of Italy has demanded that he recant his statement or resign. Because NATO, the deputy prime minister of Italy pointed out, is a, co a, a consensus-driven organization where the secretary general has no power, no ability to impose his will on anybody. So his words are not just meaningless, they're undermining the authority of NATO, further splitting NATO apart. You have some nations like France who have now, there's talk that France will be sending trainers to Ukraine. Those trainers will come home in body bags. But is Russia really concerned about French trainers? The answer is no. In the big scheme of things, no. Is Russia worried about anything that NATO can do in terms of intervening inside Ukraine? The answer is no. Politically, yes, of course. But from a military standpoint, it doesn't change the military equation at all. All it does is change the nationalities that are printed on the body bags going home from the front line. That's it. I think people need to have confidence in the Russian leadership. And I think that confidence was expressed in the most recent election, where 88% of the eligible electorate 77% of whom participated in the election, said, we support Vladimir Putin. And you see changes taking place in Russia today that reflect the strength of that mandate, uh, the cleaning up of some corruption in the Ministry of Defense, um, you know, or re certain domestic political realignments that are taking place. These are things that can only be done by a government secure in the knowledge that the vast majority of the Russian people back them. I believe the vast majority of the Russian people back Vladimir Putin. And I believe that Vladimir Putin will do what is necessary, not only to have Russia win in the special military operation, but survive intact. And that is more important in many ways than actually winning. I mean, winning, of course, is, is of utmost importance. But do you want a Pyrrhic victory? Do you want to say we won while everything is destroyed? Russia is blessed, blessed with peace and prosperity blessed with a thriving economy, blessed with cities that are growing, that are building, and not ha that, that have not been destroyed. Russia knows what it's like to have enemy forces ravage their cities, destroy their economy. It took Russia decades to rebuild from that. Decades. Today, Russia is rebuilt. Why would you throw it away? just to score some cheap political points against Ukraine and the collective West. It makes no sense.